Okay, good morning. So we've got uh, four men now. I thought three, but we've got four men who uh, are going to give us a conclusion of the sermon. And uh, Confex will come up first. He'll read a few verses and pray and then give his conclusion. And we'll try to uh, assess that. And then um, after that, we're going to go over a form, which... Um, I'm, I'm going to print, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll put it on Populi in just a minute for the long-distance students, and um, we will um, go over that form, and how, which will show you how to interface your sermon with, with actual worship service, how we do it in our churches, and then you just have to adjust it for your own, for your own church. Thank you. Convex, you can come up. I am preaching from Matthew uh, 28, verses 18 to 20. So we just read uh, this passage, and then we pray. And then I think I'll conclude when Dr. Big comes. Matthew chapter number 28, verses 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this afternoon. We thank you for the opportunity to learn. Thank you, O Lord, for the opportunity that we have, that we can be taught how we can faithfully preach your word. We thank you for our professors, whom we have used quite a number of years, and that they can offer themselves to help us as well prepare for ministry. Help us, O oh Lord, learn these things, and not just for today, but place them on our hearts so that we can use them even in the years to come. For your own glory, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Now my conclusion of the same one. Friends, Jesus Christ has given us a mission. We are to go and make disciples. He has also given us a method of carrying out this mission. But also, he has given us the motivation for going out. He is with us all the way to the end or the age. Now, friends, if we love Christ, if we want true worship to exist in this world, then we have to go. Because, as John Piper once said, missions or great commission exists because worship doesn't. Uh, kind of a good concluding paragraph that makes you want to get up and go out. That's pretty good. Your um, your hand motions are pretty good. You did a little bit too much of, of of this. You know, a little more variety at the end. You put out your left hand, but um, yeah, it, was, it was quite good. Yeah, and you had good eye contact. That was that was good. One good thing about introductions and conclusions is that the more eye contact you can have from both, really, really the better. Um, particularly a conclusion is important. It's a little bit of a short conclusion, but um, it's not altogether bad at, at, at some times. I would like to see how many applications you had in the sermon itself. If you had a lot of directions and applications in the sermon about how to go out and evangelize and so on, 
you know, then you have a lot of how-to takeaways. Maybe you don't need a long conclusion. So it may have been fine. If, however, you don't have much practical application in this sermon, then your conclusion would need to be lengthened. Okay? All right. Paul, you're next, I believe. So the text I'm going from is Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and thee not unto thine own understanding. The account of Israel journeying through the wilderness to the promised land reminds us that we need to trust in the Lord corporately. It reminds us that we need a changed trust. Many Israelites were outwardly God's people but inwardly, they still relied on their own understanding. Their real trust was revealed every time they didn't get their own way, when food or water wasn't available. Are you someone who is outwardly relying on the Lord, but inwardly on your own understanding? Are you only a Christian as far as it is convenient? Perhaps to catch the wife that you want, Listen to the warning of the disobedient Israelites who didn't have a changed trust and therefore perished in the wilderness. Get rid of that brittle crust, that, that, that brittle crutch today and trust only on the Lord. But there are many here I trust who truly are God's people. You have a changed trust. Christ is your Lord. But you are struggling to have a complete trust. There's something of Egypt that's creeping into your heart. Where's that coming from? How many day, minutes a day do you spend listening to God through his word and through his people? How many hours a day do you spend listening to the world's wisdom on television, online, or in its songs? Is that balanced? If you are to trust God completely, you need to listen to him most of all. And as a church, we can help together as we journey through the wilderness together. Let's be encouraging one another to trust only in the Lord and in his words. And we also need to encourage each other to make this a constant trust. Perhaps there is nowhere that we can help or hinder people more than in romantic relationships. And this is not just an, uh, an issue for the individual, but it's an issue for the whole congregation together. Seniors, do you encourage young people to wait for a godly partner? Or do you make them distrust the church community by constantly prodding and asking awkward questions? Fathers, do you encourage God in your responsibility? Do you, do you encourage, sorry, fathers, do you acknowledge God in your responsibility to guard your daughters from unsuitable young men? Mothers, do you trust God in this area to allow your young married couples to build their relationship even if it doesn't quite follow your blueprint and young people are you willing to acknowledge God completely in this area of your life most of all as we cross the wilderness together let's look ahead to where we're heading to beyond that final river that we all have to cross to a place where we will see our Lord face to face in that place of spotless holiness. Let's have that confident trust as we go across his road to there. That highway of spotless holiness. His word is full of signposts to it. His spirit within us prompts our consciences when we step off it. But let's rejoice most of all that our saviour has travelled it already. The one who directs our paths knows what it is like to suffer hardship on the way, to be tempted to doubt, to be bombarded by the wisdom of the world. Let's trust confidently in him who walks with us, who will never lead us nor forsake us. Whenever we start to lean on the broken crutch of our own understanding, whenever our heart has left him, whenever we fail to acknowledge him in an area of our lives, let's come back to him. He's our redeemer as well as our Lord. Let's fix our eyes on our Saviour, trusting 
confidently in him to smooth our path to the promised land as we apply the word of God to our lives. Okay. Content, content was excellent. Uh, probably the only thing I'd say on the content, Paul, is that um, the specificity of some of the questions at the beginning about, uh, you know, seeing that you're doing this with empty or are you doing that, probably would be better at, uh, thank you, would be better, you know, in the body of the sermon as you're dealing with different areas. Because there's an endless amount of questions you could ask that, that way, of course. So, so concluding questions, you're going to want to focus on the overall thrust. Are you really acknowledging the Lord in every area of your life? And I suppose you could say, you know, give one or two specific examples, but normally you would do that in the body of the sermon. But the content was, was good, and you, you addressed different groups of people. You targeted your different parts of the audience, and that, that was good. In terms of style delivery, uh, <clears throat> your, <clears throat> your voice tends to be a little bit on the higher side and a little bit on the weaker side. So I was hoping you would exert yourself, and you did somewhat. But I think you're going to have to be conscious of that as a preacher. That, uh, and you need to actually probably exert yourself a tad bit more than the average um, brother. That was also true of me, by the way, particularly when I was young. You, you maybe don't believe that now, but um, my voice was soft and kind of on the high, high tones. Over a number of years of preaching, your voice naturally deepens a bit and gets more forceful because you, you get used to speaking and having, having your voice bounce off the back wall. But you really need to think about that as you're speaking. Is my voice bouncing off the back wall? And the first... I don't know if you had two pages or what, but the first half, it seemed like it was bouncing off, maybe a little bit weakly, but still it was bouncing off. And then you were, you were exerting yourself. I could tell you were exerting yourself. You had more hand motions and a little more eye contact. Then the second half, I think you, man, I don't know if you felt this, you had to speed up or something. Maybe you thought it was a little long. So you, um, you then resorted more to reading it. And you had some very long packed sentences that were probably a little too long. The problem then was it looked, it sounded more like you're in the middle of the sermon rather than the conclusion. Even though the content was good, concluding material, but you shouldn't just read it like that at a rapid clip uh, the second half. Probably cut out <clears throat> a couple of those sentences and, and just read it with more emphasis and more feeling. And particularly the last sentence should end on a strong, strong note. But you, you kind of peter out a little bit at, at the end. Could you feel it? Um, and you did one, one cardinal no-no, and that is you, uh, in the middle of your accurate conclusion, all of a sudden you slipped your left hand into your pocket for a moment. You caught yourself. You pulled it back out. <laughs> but, but I want to catch it that you caught it. That's good. But um, just don't do that. The conclusion is, you know, when you slip your hand in the pocket, you're saying to the hearer, this, this is a relaxed atmosphere. You can sit back and take it easy. Uh, that's the message you're <laughs> Sorry for catching you on that. <laughs> I knew I was going to get that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Today, uh, text is on uh, Romans chapter. Chapter 7, uh, verses 7 to 12. Romans 7, verses 7 to 12. The real culprit is not the law, which has intentionally holy, just, and good. It is sin, which muses it, uh, misuses it to the law. This is what Paul has keep emphasizing in our today's passage, that the nature of the law exposes the sins and condemns the sin. On the other hand, 
the law itself does not bring death. It is the sin which brings death to earth. We have to be aware that the law cannot save us. The law itself does not promise life to us. But in, we, we cannot save ourselves because we cannot keep all the commandments of God. We are all the law breakers. We sin against God. We have fall short the glory of God. No one can deliver us, deliver us out of the bondage of sin. Because we are all sinners. We are all the law breakers. But Jesus Christ is the law keeper. He keeps all the commandments of God. Praise be to God, for we have just a God that keeps all the commandments. That's why He is qualified. He is able to save us out of the bondage of sin. Dear congregation, we have such a God. We have, we have Christ that imputes His righteousness to us so that we can make peace to the God in heaven. Okay. All right. Uh, good, good measure of passion. Uh, my, only, my only two criticisms, you did it well, you did it well, only two criticisms would be that some of the material that you gave in the first half, I would think you would have been giving that in the body of the sermon as well. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe you were just summarizing. And that's, in that sense, it's always hard to judge it when you haven't heard the sermon, but in that sense, it may have, it may have been fine. Um, <coughs> It might have been good in a sermon on this kind of text to say, you know, here are, here are two or three takeaways or two or three thoughts I want you to go home with that you can practice by the grace of God, work on these things. Uh, that might have been a little more effective, but your expression was good, your hand motions were good, uh, good energy, good sense of sincerity, conviction, so that, that came across well. Um, the last sentence, I didn't realize you stopped. I'm not sure you knew you were going to stop. <laughs> so the, the last sentence um, sort of kind of left us hanging up in the air. Uh, but it, that's okay. You have to move. But you know normally you wouldn't do that, right? You'd, you'd have a final sentence and you'd say amen after it. And we'd feel like the sermon was over. But uh, no, pretty good. Right? My sermon is from Luke 2.52. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. My theme has been Jesus prepared for perfection. And my points were perfection in body and perfection in soul. Dear congregation, as we conclude, I want you to see that the conclusion or the culmination of this preparation for Jesus' perfection, really we see in the next chapter of our text in chapter 3, where Jesus' baptism occurs. And this incredible scene culminating in this wondrous declaration from God this is my beloved son, this being Jesus, about 30 years old. You see, verse 52 is surrounded by two age references, Jesus 12 years old and then Jesus 30 years old, and we've surveyed how he's being prepared by the Spirit for his messianic work. And here we have the declaration of the Father telling us that this is the one in whom the Father delights. This is the whole, perfect, complete Christ. Christ, perfect in all things. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. He progressed and increased. He grew in favor with God and man. And being made perfect or complete, lacking in nothing, he became the author of eternal salvation. 
have seen this text uncover for us that indissoluble knot of the divine and the humane person of Christ. Yet the overriding emphasis is how he has been matured by the Spirit to be our eternal mighty Savior. He grew up in perfection, not just in body or in soul, but we may say in messiahship, in his Christhood. He became a complete and full, mighty Christ. And may we rest in him, whose work of Calvary is complete and entire, lacking nothing, because this Christ is perfected. Amen. Yeah, good, Ryan. No, no criticisms at all on the um, style of delivery. A good, good balance of urgency, and um, you could feel your winding down, and yet your tone of voice said what I'm still saying is very important. So that's good. Um, in terms of content, the content itself is fine. I think probably I would have said, or maybe you would have said this early in the sermon too, but I think it would have been good at the end. Instead of saying, may we, may we rest in this Christ, to ask the question, are, are, you, are you resting in this Christ? And um, maybe it would have been good, just an idea, it's not an absolute right or wrong, or it must be, but maybe it would have been a good idea, if you haven't done too much of it in the sermon, to then say, how may we know if we're resting in, 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 in this Christ, uh, yes or no? And um, relative to, to this content, and then give one or two marks so people can leave with a self examination note at the end. It's something to think about, anyway. All right, well, I hope you've enjoyed the exercise. And as uh, <clears throat> much as I've enjoyed listening to you, overall, I'm quite pleased, and I, I feel that you all did, did, did really fairly well. And we're just tweaking different things. But I think you've got the idea down of what a conclusion is to be. And that's a, that's a good thing. All right. So what we're going to do for the rest of the hour now, we've got um, 45 minutes. I think I can do this in about 45 minutes or 50 minutes. I want you to take into hand that sheet. If you didn't get it when you walked in, a couple of you were late, uh, or, titled Order of Worship. Go, go ahead and pick up that sheet. And for those of you coming in long distance, it just got put up on Populi, so you should be able to find it. Order of worship. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to walk you through this. It's really spelled out in detail already, but I just want to make some comments as I go of how we would go through our liturgy uh, in a normal Sunday morning and then how you would relate that to, to the sermon. All right, so in our church, what happens is the minister stands at the foot of the pulpit for a moment, has a silent prayer while the whole congregation is praying. He then ascends the pulpit, and we think it's best, rather than say good morning, rather than, than have just a casual greeting, and your tradition may differ from us on that, we think it's best to just immediately begin with the um, greeting from God rather than from men. And so we simply <clears throat> fold our hands and we say our help is in the name of the Lord who has made heaven and earth, who keeps truth forever and who never forsakes the works of his own hands. And... Um, Interesting story. I had an elder who, who passed away in his mid-70s, rather tragically. He was driving across um, a belt line and um, wasn't thinking, and he just drove right across the belt line, went through a stoplight, and a car going 60 miles an hour picked him off, and he was killed instantly. Um, man was probably one of the most zealous Christians well, not probably. Definitely one of the most zealous Christians I've ever known in my life. Just a thorough, thoroughly sound, reformed, wonderful brother. 
And uh, after every sermon, we walk back in the consistory room. He just carry on with the sermon. He poured his heart. He'd often be weeping. It was just beautiful, beautiful. I missed him so much after he died. But he was converted when he was three years old. And um, there was a man named Reverend Kirsten who was the founder of the, uh, the Mother Church in the Netherlands who came by on a visit. And when he stood up on the pulpit and pronounced these words, our help is in the name of the Lord, uh, God used that for his conversion at three years old. <laughs> So it's just an interesting story, but an amazing thing. You, you, even a greeting from God can be used uh, for spiritual benefit. And then um, what we do in our church is we um, raise our hands after, to pronounce the blessing of God. First is like a salutation. The second is a blessing. And we say, usually in the morning, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Or um, in the evening, we usually say, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, which is to come, from the seven spirits which are before his throne, from Jesus Christ, etc. Um, that salutation and benediction combination if you do it for a long period of time in your church, becomes very dear to people. And uh, I even have it still when I go to other churches and they don't do it. They just start out in a, on a man-centered level. Uh, I feel like something's missing. Now, if you're not used to it, you won't miss it, of course. But it's something for you to think about, that a service should really begin with God's greeting and God's blessing rather than man's and then we say dear congregation let us sing psalter so and so or you know hymn so and so you would probably say and uh, we often read the first stanza or part of it and um, then we repeat it always when you give out a a hymn or a psalter always repeat the number and there are in every congregation, people that are hard of hearing, and if your church building doesn't have a tea loop, uh, which really wonderfully helps hard of hearing people, um, if it doesn't have that, it's very good that you say Psalter 344, and then in your second repetition, because for hard of hearing people, it sounds like this, 344. You know, it's hard to distinguish. Your second repetition, just say, three, four, four. And I have, I have several hard of hearing people who tell me they appreciate that when I do that. I don't always do it, but they say I really appreciate it. Because I, I often miss the first time you get out the number, but the second time when you do each number individually, I get it. Now, happily, we also have our numbers on a board, and many of the people can see that, and so they make ends meet, even though they're hard of hearing. But some people are hard of hearing and uh, don't have very good sight either. So it's just, a, it's just a nice token for older people. You know, when you speak to old people, you've got to speak slower, and you've got to emphasize your words and clear diction particularly when you're on the phone, because they can't read your lips at all. And uh, older people just really, really appreciate that. Or when you visit them, I usually sit right beside them if I know they're hard of hearing, and I speak very loudly, so loudly you feel like you're being foolish. But they love that, and they don't have to strain them to listen. And, of course, I, I myself am a little hearing impaired, and so it's just wonderful when people, you know, speak with some volume and clarity uh, in, a, in a church service for, for people who, who have those difficulties. So just be really clear in all the liturgy you give, but don't repeat it three times or four times. Twice is enough. And then in the morning, we read the Holy Law of God, and this is what we usually say. Let us read together the Holy Law of God as recorded in Exodus 20. 
And sometimes, right after that, we say, or we say before we read the law, immediately after the reading of the law, we will sing Psalter number so and so, usually just one stanza, so that people can reflect upon the reading of the law. And then after the law is read, um, some once in a while we connect it with Matthew 22, 37 through 40. We'll say something like this after we read the law. Now you can find the summary of the law in Matthew 22, 37 to 40. We might read that, or sometimes we read Deuteronomy 5 instead of Exodus 20. Or sometimes we read a little bit further in Exodus 20, show some of the ceremonial laws and this gospel on both sides of the law, implying that the law also is embedded in grace. And once in a while a comment to that effect is good. Most of the time we read the law without comment. But a little diversity is good for your people. Just don't get too carried away. And re Remember when you do liturgy, some, some pastors when they do liturgy, every step of the way they're explaining everything. I think, you know what, for once or twice that might be good, but if you had to sit and listen to that all the time, uh, it take, the clock is ticking. Time is precious and it's taking up precious seconds. And before you know it, those seconds turn into minutes if you're ad-libbing about why we're doing this in the liturgy and why we're doing that. All right, then in the evening, instead of reading the law, we usually read um, from the Apostles' Creed or we read from one of the doctrinal standards. And the standard thing to say in our churches, at least, is we will now make confession of faith from the Apostles' Creed with the Church of All Ages. I would not say we will now read from the Cans of Dort with the Church of All Ages. Uh, I heard one of our ministers do that recently because um, 1619 doesn't really lend itself to all ages. But the Apostles' Creed is early on in church history, so that's an appropriate comment. And the Apostles' Creed, of course, is embraced by the, the Christian church in its entire breadth. Uh, if, you can, if you can't say yes to the Apostles' Creed, you probably belong to a sect and not to the Christian church. And you can't say yes with fuller statements of faith. Um, so we have a reading system now, which I really like. We read through the Belgian Confession, Can Canons of Dort, Westminster Confession, Shorter Catechism, Larger Catechism. And um, we put the reading for the catechism, for the Westminster material in the bulletin every Sunday. And the rest is in the back of the Psalter, so people can follow along. And um, it only takes two or three minutes. But it, it's like a dripping faucet. After a while, it, it, it finds its way down inside the church, inside people's hearts, and they get to understand over years what the Canons of Dort say and, and what the Westminster Standards say, and it's a good thing to do, to embed your people in the Reformed faith. Yes? I like the use of these in the, in the church. Just you like the use of what? I like the way these are used, but I'm just wondering how you would answer someone who says you're putting the confessions at a too high a level right. by, by doing this. What, what would your... Yeah, I would say this to them. I'd say, well, you notice that when we read them in the evening, we don't do like the morning where we read the law before the scripture reading because the law is also the word of God. But we always read it afterward to show its subserviency to the scriptures. But secondly, it is extremely good for a church to understand its summary of what it believes. And we believe that these confessions have been hammered out in church history with the assistance of the Holy Spirit as very fitting summaries for what the Bible says about these topics. So just by reading them, we're not saying that they're infallible, but we're saying we do trust that these are good summaries of, of the Word of God. And we think it's important that our people are well-versed in, in the doctrines of the Bible, understand what they say. It's one of the great problems of our day is when people don't understand doctrine. They're susceptible to all kinds of false views and every wind of doctrine. So just a minute or two to remind them this is what the church Reformed churches uh, throughout the centuries since the Reformation have said it's a summary view of what the Bible says about this particular topic. This is a good thing to keep in front of our people. But don't worry, my friend. 
We don't overdo it. You know, it's only a couple minutes in the service, uh, but it's it's a significant part. And if you feel in your church you don't want to do that, that's up to you. But in our tradition, that uh, is appreciated by our people. And it helps them get to know things, know doctrine better. Something like that. Yeah? Dr. P, that's, that's what Winter said. Uh, I've seen that in the pre formed and that maybe in our heritage as well. They, they, um, the Apostles' Creed is cited by only the minister. Uh, back in my tradition, everybody cites. Is there right. any difference why you do that? Or? Um, I suppose there is a little bit. It's mostly a tradition. But, um, yeah, I'd say most churches that I go to today, they, they recite the Apostles' Creed together. Personally, I like that. Um, but I think in the, the um, conservative Reformed churches in the Netherlands, the idea always was that the minister would lead the whole service and they were, I don't know exactly why, but, you know, we had to come up in our consistory recently, you know, can't the whole congregation say the Apostles' Creed, and I would have voted for it. I don't see any problem with it. Um, but there's a couple of men that said, oh, we've got too many changes lately, you know, and we don't want to change. So it's, it's not a real big deal. I didn't hear any principled objections. Right? What would you say to someone who says regular principle, you're introducing foreign elements of worship? Right. Well, I mean, I would use the same argument that I use for preaching the Hunter Catechism, that if this is a summary of what Scripture says, we really believe this is scriptural, and uh, therefore... Um, you wouldn't object, would you, my friend, if I were to preach for five minutes on the doctrine of election and try to explain to you, why should you object if for one minute I read it to you, which is a collective body representing all the Reformed churches of that day to say it succinctly uh, unto edification. So we don't believe it contradicts the Bible. We believe it's really a clear elucidation of the Bible, which is really what all the preaching is. Yeah. I'm not in this class, but... Huh? I'm not in this class, but may I ask a question? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I'm not a professor. I said, I'm not in this class, but I want to ask a question. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just suddenly realized at the same time I, I, I might as well oh, put this on. <laughs> I did hear you. Okay. Therefore, why is the catechism not referenced or cited during the preaching, which is pretty much what my background we, we do. We reference it a lot. Many preachers, they, they reference the Westminster Sabbath during the message, but they don't have a moment on the worship service where they, they, they read it as, a, as an element. Uh, they may have in Sunday school, actually. My own church does it in right. Sunday school. Uh, on, on e e e either way, either way is fine. We we just feel that when you read it systematically through piece by piece, instead of just the minister quoting one particular line or one sentence within a whole paragraph, that it's good for the congregation to hear the whole paragraph, to hear how the whole doctrine. And I think during the sermon, you can't really read from the Westminster Confession for two minutes straight, uh, it wouldn't be edifying. It'd be too long of a quote. But if, if your church hasn't done that and you don't feel any need to do that, that's up to you. Yeah. It's not a necessity. As long as you don't condemn us for doing it as well. <laughs> there is some freedom on, on some of these things. All right. Then when it comes to the prayer, um, Churches do this differently, but again, I'm just going to tell you what we do. We tend to have just two prayers per service. One we call the long prayer, just before the sermon. And the other one is just referred to as the concluding prayer, which is usually one to two minutes. Uh, the long prayer is generally 10 to 12 minutes, I would say. And um, before we pray... We usually say this, we wish to remember in prayer this morning or this evening, in addition to those listed in the bulletin, 
We don't repeat all the names, particularly in a larger, a small church you could, but in a larger church, you can't repeat the 12 or 13 names that are listed in the bulletin. It takes, again, precious, precious time. So people have looked at the bulletin, they've seen who's sick, who's in the hospital, but inevitably between Friday noon and Sunday morning, on an average, there's one to three more cases uh, that need to be known in the congregation, but it was too late for the bulletin. Hence, hence this, this, this prayer, or this comment before we pray. And we say, in addition to those listed in the bulletin, we remember in prayer this morning, Mr. and Mrs. So, Mr. And Mrs. So-and-so, who's in Butterworth Hospital, or who was privileged to return home from the hospital, or who were blessed with a baby girl, whatever it is. And then you say, let us now call upon the name of God to ask his blessing upon the service, or something like that. Now, in the prayer, um, there are a number of things to remember. I've just given you real little notes here that might be helpful to you as you start out in a church. Um, first, how you, address, you, how you address God. You see, you spend um, three, four, five sentences just declaring who God is and how great he is and just telling him how great he is in prayer at the beginning. That's what we call adoration. It's a good way to begin prayer, to just adore God. And then um, a typical thing would be to gratefully acknowledge that we may meet together, and then to confess our sin and our unworthiness. Um, and periodically in your prayer, it would be good to root that in our deep fallen Adam, that people realize where the root of sin came from. Um, and then normally, we would move to praying for God's people, that there would be, gr be growth and grace under this sermon. And often we would spend five or six or seven sentences taking the theme of the sermon right here and, and sort of weaving it into our prayer spontaneously and praying that God's people would... Let's, let's say you know, someone just did Matthew 28, 18 to 20, right? About the Great Commission. You, then you, you would naturally pray in that, in that prayer as you're about to hear that sermon that God would give us big evangelistic hearts for the unsaved, give us desire to, to reach them, to proclaim Christ's name. You know, you make some statements in prayer that would reflect, give little hints of what's coming in the sermon without giving away your whole sermon, of course. Um, and then you would pray for the unsaved. Uh, don't ever forget that because... It, there are always unsaved people in your church, uh, with rare exceptions, I should think. Pray that they would be saved. You might also pray for the self-deceived. I don't do that every Sunday, but every now and then, people who think they're saved, but really aren't saved, whose lives don't show it. Uh, and then uh, maybe once in a while, pray for beginners in grace who can't believe God's really at work with them, but uh, he is and uh, that they may come to greater faith or something like that. And then you remember the sick. That's when you would go through the, um, through the list in the bulletin. Now, I served three churches in my life, and they all have around 700 people. And so I'm used to, all my life, an average of five to eight people to remember. In my first two churches, I never opened my eyes in prayer, never read a word I prepared in prayer. It was always spontaneous because I could remember seven or eight names and not worry that I'd forget one. Um, and the rare occasion where I forgot one, I would uh, bring it in the closing prayer, which isn't always the best because people think, oh, well, the minister forgot me first. So yeah, I remember me at the end. But when I came to Grand Rapids and you know, when I came here, there was a thousand people in church, and sometimes it's like 21 people. I said, okay, forget it. I broke with this tradition, and I do look down now and um, carry with me on a little sheet of paper all the names of all the people I need to pray for, and um, I just can't remember them all. Um, the difficulty in praying for a whole group of people like that one by one is, is redundancy. You know, if six people are in the hospital and they're all facing surgery, how do you come up with six different things? 
it's perfectly okay to group them all together and pray for them as a, as a group and just mention their names. Uh, the problem with that, however, is that often there's a real unevenness in terms of their need. You know, one person may be in there for critical condition and may be hanging to life with a thin thread. The other person is going in to have their tonsils out or something, you know. So you wouldn't group them together, would you, and, and pray exactly the same thing. So you need, you need some common sense here. Obviously, those people who are in serious condition, you'd pray more than one sentence about, and you'd pray for their relatives, maybe even mention their relatives by name, and you'd pray with much feeling. This is a huge thing in their lives. And things that are more routine, someone's going in for a hernia, or if there's three or four of those, you can group those together. That would be good. But seri if it's serious cases, I would never, I would always take them individually. Okay? That's just a word to the wise on that. Um, I think people will be offended, at least in our circles, if you group them in together with other people and think that people are in a serious condition. Don't forget special needs people, handicapped people. Um, I would forget that sometimes, and we have several handicapped people in our church, and one of the parents would always remind me, and I feel embarrassed when they have to remind me. Um, a lonely people? It's so hard to believe that in our day and age, with so much going on, so many opportunities, and you are so busy as a pastor, you can hardly catch your breath, that people are actually lonely in this world? But there are a lot of lonely people, especially older people, and uh, they appreciate being remembered. Yes, Ryan. How would you pray for people who are delicate? Yeah, yeah. I would just say, Lord, remember special needs people with the particular trials that they face. Help them in those trials and help them uh, to, to, to look to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, as enabled, and to find their life in him. But I would also remember the caregivers, as they um, uh, just simply say, remember the caregivers for those who have special needs, strengthen them with all the challenges they face, and help them to persevere by thy grace in caring for their dear ones, something like that. Yep? I think just related to the bulletin, um, I know that is not a thing here. Back in my country, we don't have bulletins. Okay. Announcements, special announcements. So yep, and you've got to announce all those people, don't you? Yeah, so I was wondering, like, like the church in the West, was there a point where by you didn't have bulletins, you have to make the announcements in church? Uh, in my first church, they did not like bulletins at all. Yeah, I brought the bulletin. Oh, no, actually, it had just started before I came, yeah. So how, do, how like, the church doesn't have bulletins, how would they do it? Would the minister make all those announcements that are on the bulletin, or... Well, yeah, in the olden days when I first became a minister, ages ago, um, there weren't many church activities. There was maybe a youth group and a ladies' aid. That was about it. There were no Bible study groups, no prayer meetings. It, it just were, there weren't many things going on. So I could read those announcements, especially in smaller churches where I was a moderator over them because I didn't have a minister. They, had, they, all, they usually had no bulletin. And you just had to read maybe that much, maybe a minute and a half before you prayed. And that was doable. But um, as people have gotten more involved in church life and more mission outreach and more committees and more evangelism and more, more ministries like seminary and printing ministries, so many things to remember, so many meetings that are taking place, it, it really helps to have a bulletin. But your culture is, is, is probably much more oral than our culture, and um, so you have to adjust yourself to that, that style, of course. It doesn't pay to take back American practices there. Um, it's also why in your culture, uh, because it's more oral and written, ministers tend to repeat more during the sermon. That's more of an oral thing. And we tend to go from A to B to C, and you tend to go from A to B to C to B to C to C to D to D, C to D, E. You know, that's more your culture, and that's perfectly acceptable. In fact, 
a wise minister would, 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 would try to understand what culture he's in. And I know that's rather challenging to change your ways, but if I'm preaching in Africa, I should feel freer to repeat myself coming from America, remembering that this is the way the ministers preach over here. All right. Um, widows and widowers. <clears throat> That's another one I get a complaint on if I go three or four weeks without remembering them specifically. I'll usually have a widow call me up and say, you haven't been remembering the widows lately. And go, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so this little list I gave you here is something you might want to kind of have handy. In fact, it um, wouldn't even be a bad idea to just cut this little two paragraphs out and slip it in your Bible and once a month look at it and say, are there groups I'm forgetting here? Um, secret sufferers. There are a lot of people that have chronic pain, people that are struggling in their marriages, um, that don't come to the foreground, they're not in the hospital, they don't want to bother the preacher. Well, this is a way of including all these people. And then seniors, parents, families, young people, children. I think this is very important to pray. We usually do that in the evening, but at least once a Sunday to pray for families, uh, that parents and children will get along well, that they respect each other, that children will be obedient to their parents, and so on. And that marriages will be strengthened. And of course, you're going to remember the church, the local church, the denomination, the mission, you should regularly remember the missionaries you have, uh, evangelism efforts also among the Jews. Um, remember the ministers in your denomination and all around the world, really, when they're faithful. Remember the theological students. And then from time to time, I mean, you can't do this all in one prayer, but from time to time, remember each of the local ministries you have. Uh, we have an inheritance publishers committee in our church that sends out 22,000 sermon booklets, little sermon booklets, every three or four months. Oh, once in a while, particularly when we have a collection for them, I might just remember them in prayer in, in two or three sentences. Yeah? Why, why are we especially selected the Jews? Yes. Well, as God's ancient people, um, and... There, there ought to be a soft spot in our hearts that the Jews have rejected the Messiah that was sent to them and that God will return and fulfill his promise in Romans 11 that a goodly number of the Jews will return to the Lord. So we're longing for that promise to be fulfilled. I get people that complain I don't pray more for the Jews, actually, but I, I, I'm careful. I don't want to distinguish the Jews too much from the Gentiles here, but there is something to say for the, uh, the grief that we feel in our hearts that the Jews have rejected the Messiah who grew up among them. Lord, turn it around. Um, denominational ministries. Uh, remember also from time to time, if you have printed ministries, our churches really excel in that, of course, because we have Reformation Heritage books, which is not technically a Indirectly, it's a church ministry, not technically. But, um, and we have Banner of Sovereign Grace, Truth. We've got these, this sermon ministry. We've got gospel trumpet sermons. These are things worthy to rem be remembered from time to time. Um, I still got the word tapes on here. I hope you can tell how old it was when I made this sheet out originally. Um, CDs. Uh, if you have a CD ministry or some, some, something of that nature or internet ministry, that should be put on here. Um, prison jail ministry, radio ministry. These are all things that would, would, would be important in our circles. And then the Christian schools. That's a biggie. Um, the elders actually say to us who, as pastors, don't ever forget on a single Sunday the Christian school. This is huge. Our Christian school costs well over $2 million a year to run. It's a very complex operation. Tons and tons of volunteers. School board works hard. Bus drivers want, want prayers for the children for safety and so on. So there's a lot to pray for with your daily Christian schools. Government and nation. Here you want to strike a balance. 
You want to pray for the president with respect. Uh, if, if the president is really bad, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a delicate balance here because you, you can't just lambast him from the pulpit. But you can pray that God would change his heart, God would change his mind on things like abortion or same-sex marriage. And I think we can pray with some urgency here and some passion and, and some, um, even a little bit of righteous anger in our tone. When we've got leaders taking, us, taking this nation down into the quicksand of uh, degradation, we, 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 we need to be urgent in these prayers. Um, abortion, euthanasia, Sabbath keeping. And then pray for reformation and revival. And always near the end of your prayer, it's good to just simply ask the Lord to help you in preaching. And uh, usually end your prayer for the, for the forgiveness of sins for Christ's sake. Now there's just the bare, bare bones, okay? But what I want you to see and I want to emphasize here is it's good to bring in some sentences in this long prayer that will reflect or relate in some way to the sermon you're about to preach. So there's some interfacing between the prayer and the message. And then we say, let us continue our service with the singing of Psalter number so-and-so. Um, usually we have more stanzas here to sing because we take up a collection at the same time. And we say, in the meantime, your offering will be received for, we name the fund, and we say something like this, may the Lord bless you and your gifts. Some churches have a prayer here for, for, the, for the money given. In Dutch tradition, it, that really is, is not done. I don't know why exactly, but probably because we don't want much focus on, on money uh, in a worship service. Um, I think I've preached one sermon in 38 years on stewardship. And pro I probably should have preached more. But we don't have stewardship Sundays or all of that stuff that so many churches have. Yeah. I, think, I think my dad's comment to me when I was a boy summarizes it up. He says, son, if you become a minister someday, just remember this. The best way to move people to give generously to the cause of Jesus Christ is to preach well. Because where the heart goes open, the wallet will go open as well. So you don't open the wallet by telling people they've got to give a lot and pressing them, making them feel guilty. That works for a little while. But you really want the focus to be on spiritual content. And once people feel that, um, that will really bond them to, to give. I found it extremely interesting that several years ago, what was it, five, six years ago, when there was a real economic downturn, or four years ago, and seminaries around the country were really suffering. I had a lot of people come up to me wherever I went, you know, how's your seminary doing? Are you able to hold up? And I could say to them, yeah, we, always, we are always on a short leash, no doubt about that. But I had not noticed, and I didn't notice through that entire economic downturn, one bit of dip in giving. I couldn't think of anyone. And it showed me something I think is kind of sweet, that our donors are really giving from the heart, and they're committed to this seminary. And I think that is a reflection of the fact that um, uh, the majority of our donors are really spiritually minded people, and they feel deeply about what we're doing here. And so... When there was an economic downturn, they didn't say, well, the first thing we can cut off is some, some seminary giving. No, maybe they cut giving somewhere else, but they, they kept on giving to the seminary because they saw its importance. So that's, that's encouraging, actually. Um, all right. Then you have your introduction of your sermon, and then you, you might say something like this, in the words of our text, you can find in so-and-so. And, -so. and um, if your words of your text really are like 10, 12 verses. You don't want to read all 10, 12 verses again. As a rule, don't read more than three verses again. You've just read it 15 minutes ago. And you could say then something like this. Well, our text will be, you know, John 1, verses 1 to 18. I hope it's never that long. Uh, but I'll read again only verse 14 at the present time. But then the congregation knows 
You're going to be walking through this whole passage, but this verse is a particularly key verse. That, send, that sends a clear message to them and keeps you from having to, again, take up three, four minutes just rereading. And then I usually say something like this, the subject we, we, or the theme that we wish to consider. I always say, with God's help, with God's help, is, because I need God's help. And I know that sounds like a redundancy every time. But um, I'll tell you, too, if I didn't say it, I'd have people complain about that. Because people want to feel that the minister really needs God's help as well. And I, and I do feel it. So, um, or with divine assistance or something like that. Faith and the means of grace, which we hope to see in three thoughts. First, the origin of faith. Secondly, the strength of faith. And thirdly, the foundation of faith. And then what we do in our circles is we repeat that, the theme and the points, to show how important it is for the whole sermon to come, gets people's attention, and it also helps people to write it down. Sometimes when they write it down, they get... They miss a point, and you repeat it. They fill in the blank. So a lot of people are grateful for that. And then, of course, we do this really odd thing that nobody understands. Um, is we usually have, if we have three points, we usually preach two of them, and then we interrupt the sermon, have everyone stand up and sing, and then sit down again, and we do the third point. Um, that's done for two reasons historically. One is because we tend to preach long, 50 to 60 minutes. Um, my average sermon is probably 55, 57 minutes, somewhere in there. And that's a long time to sit without a break. Sometimes it gives people a, a good break. Uh, and they're a little more lively when they sit down again. They've got a little blood flowing and they can take another 15 minutes a little easier. Sometimes it's a pain in the neck, quite frankly, to have that song in there because if the minister's really feeling freedom, it feels like an interruption. Uh, other times, when you're plowing on rocks, you're kind of glad to have it <laughs> so you can kick back in. So it's just a matter of fact that that's what we do. And the, the origin of it is very concrete. The origin of it comes from the Netherlands. And what they would do is they would preach all three points in about 40 minutes. And then they would stand up and sing. They called it the tupa sing, the, the application song. And then after the song, the minister would give all his applications to what he had said. And the applications were usually 15 minutes long. So he, he'd go back over his three points then. Um, and so I didn't feel, when I became a minister, I didn't feel that was the best way to preach. So, but I didn't want to offend people and drop the, the songs. I would have got a lot of objections. So what I just did is I'm actually the one that invented this, do two points and then sing and then do the third point because I like to see applications move through the sermon closer to the points. I think people grab hold of them better. And to preach for 40 minutes without any applications, I think puts people to sleep. So then some ministers started to copy me and that's how, in the NRC today even, I think, I think almost all the ministers do it this way. But this was the old, old style. 19th century, early 20th century. All your applications were together after the two passing. Uh, and then after the application uh, song, and you, 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 you've got your third point there, and you speak that, normally... The, the, the rule of thumb would be to have two to four concluding applications, takeaways. And, of course, that's what we've been working on right now. Um, now, in terms of time frame, again, this is our circles. You may have to cut that down in your circles. If each point, ideally, could be an average of 13 to 15 minutes, leaving you with five to 10 minutes for a concluding application. Um, Points longer than 15 minutes will inevitably force you to try to catch up for the remainder of the service. And one of my most difficult things, and I, I still have trouble with it, is you preach a three-point sermon, and somehow you think you don't have enough material for the sermon, and you end up going 22 minutes on the first point, and then you're playing catch-up the whole rest of the sermon. And afterwards, you, you get in the car, and you're frustrated with yourself. 
Why did I go so long in that first point? Uh, so hopefully you can do better than I did in my lifetime on that and pace yourself a little bit better because it's, it's always so easy for me to go over time on my first point and then I get behind. Try to say amen at the end of the service. Again, this is in our service. Our services are supposed to be 90 minutes. They tend to be 95 usually. But ideally, at the 80-minute point or 85-minute point at the latest, we should say amen and uh, have the closing part of the, of the, of the liturgy. It takes seven or eight minutes with a song and a prayer and the doxology. So that people, like my wife says, People really should be walking out in an hour and a half. We're, we're stretching it when we go over it, and uh, we often do stretch it a few minutes. But in our circles, 95 minutes is okay. If you go to 100 minutes and people are walking out, at 100 minutes, inevitably we get some complaints. After the end of the sermon, you pause, you close with a short prayer. Without a prefatory remark, you just pray. And pray specifically to the message that's just been brought. And after the prayer, you say, let us close by singing such and such. And then the doxology, the organist immediately follows along and prays that. Um, if you're a theological student and you're not a minister, you would not say the normal, um, the normal benedictions at the end, which are Trinitarian benedictions that ministers say with their hands outstretched. As a student, you do not, in our circles, uh, stretch out your hands. Instead, you're asked to say to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the God whom we adore, be glory as it was, is now, and shall be forevermore. Amen. So that would apply directly to you, Ryan. I don't know if you know that or not, but That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. All right. Any questions about this? Yes, Paul. Can you explain the rationale of the benediction? Rationale, the benediction. Okay. Yeah. There's always been a debate uh, about that, but it's, it's grounded in Old Testament benedictions. And the idea is that God pronounces his blessing upon his people who have received his word in faith. Doesn't mean that everybody gets the blessing. But it's something more than a mere wish. It's something that an ordained minister of the gospel, on, on the authority of being ordained as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, pronounces upon a congregation that those who receive the word in faith receive the blessing of the Lord. That's why, when you're a theological student and you're not ordained yet, um, you know, you're not allowed to really pronounce the benediction with your hands outstretched, laying the blessing, as it were, on the congregation in God's behalf because you're not ordained. And yet, the words that you say as a student are, are very similar. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a slight difference there. Just like students can't do the sacraments uh, because that's, in the Reformed tradition, reserved only for those who are ordained. Yeah. So are you saying that if someone reads out one of Paul's closing letter benedictions, that is more of a prayer if it's just read out. Um, but if the minister's there, he's saying that this is not just a, it's not a request to God, it's a promise from God. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, the word promise is a good, a good word, yeah. Simon. Yeah, I know they do. I know they do. Um, I don't prefer it myself, but, you know, I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's an absolute no-no. Uh, if, if you're coming into a church and they're used to putting the music on the wall, um, I wouldn't walk in there and, and say, you know, take that off the wall, I don't believe in that, let's get books back in the pews. Uh, I, I would probably go along with that. What I think really detracts from preaching is when, when a minister uses a PowerPoint 
and you see all his points, and you're looking over at the points, and you're looking at the ministry, you're looking over at the points, you know, there the reformers would have some serious objections because they would say, God has ordained the minister through his whole appearance, his whole body is preaching. Um, it's the vocal word. It's not the, not the, 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 the preached word is not a word that's written on a wall. It's, that's why you don't hand out your sermon to people either when, when you walk into church. It's a danger, too, of handing out two detailed outlines that people are, 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 get the gist of the whole sermon before you preach it. Um, Through the lively preaching of the word, says the Heidelberg Catechism, God saves those that believe. And anything that takes away from the lively preaching of the word is a negative in the act of preaching. All right, Confex, Ryan, and then Shema. Yeah, on the benediction, does it also apply at the beginning? There's a, this kind of a benediction that is given out for students or those who are not ordained. Um, are they supposed to say, they say, grace, mercy, and peace be granted to you? No, no, they say, um, don't I have that down here? Oh, I see. Um, Yeah, I think the did did, did Reverend Kelderman? Yeah, we just say the bottom and amen. And yeah, amen. that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I couldn't think. Of, I couldn't think of it for a moment. So, yeah. Just to gently push back on the PowerPoint, not because I disagree with that point that you Are you you're objecting to the changing of slides during the sermon? Or are you objecting to the fact that there's information about the sermon on the wall? Because in my mind, if that's the case, we, we hand out bulletins with yeah. three points on the team. No. So what precisely yeah. is the objection? Yeah. Well, if they put on the wall just the three main points, um, you know, I was not in favor, really, when, when they asked us to, 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 to even do the outlines in the bulletin. But I, I went along with it because people said it follows the sermon better. Okay. But... Mostly what they do is when you, when you um, at least the PowerPoint sermons I've seen ministers preach, is they put up a new point every time they, and they say, now you can see over there, you know, and, and the attention is going back and forth, back and forth from the wall over there to the minister. And I think it takes away from something of the, um, of the pathos of the moment with the minister. Maybe it's a gut level feel for me. Um, that's one reason why even, even in the lecture room, I, I, I don't use all the modern conveniences, most of the other professors, but it's, this is a lecture. I have no trouble with that. Okay, if they want to use PowerPoint, great. But, you know, when you are full with unction of the Holy Spirit, to be flipping up another point and people are reading it over there and they're looking back at you and going back and forth, I think you'll lose something, but maybe I'm just an old man. Uh, Yeah, I would say that. I think that's a good way of putting it. It's more expedient for the, for the nature of preaching. And I'm a little uncomfortable with an extensive outline being thrown on the wall because I think it, anything takes away from the lively preaching of the word, um, I think is a drawback in the act of preaching. Becomes, it becomes more like a lecture. It easily can easily become that, yeah. So I think maybe it's a Westminster Confessional place. It says the only visible signs in the worship uh, in the church is baptism and the, the bread and wine. Right. So the PowerPoint is this related to? It's kind of another visible tool. So we're we are regulatively it is abandoned, or it's more kind of effect. Uh, is showing reducing the. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say it's a sin that they're abandoning, you know, adding another visual element uh, to the service because, yeah, I, I, I like the way Ryan put it. I don't think it's edifying for the pathos of the preacher to, to do that. Um, again, if, if he just had three points that were up there, like, like we do in the bulletin, I don't think people are going to be drawn back and forth so much, but 
the focus should be on the minister preaching and his whole body language, his gestures, his facial expressions, the way he speaks, uh, the urgency, the, the spirit of unction. Um, it, it focuses on you. That's why you're not standing in the back of the church and people just hearing your voice because God speaks through the human instrument, through the lively preaching of the word. And when there's other things around, be it an outline or be it other instruments or other things or music going in the background, it all takes away from what the reformer said, the lively preaching of the word. We don't need anything else. We are the instruments God has chosen to speak through. As Calvin says, God uses the Holy Spirit and the minister as the, as the, the double minister in the sermon. As the one speaks, the other is speaking. I'm also afraid sometimes of when you start using PowerPoints and other things in the sermon that one thing leads to another. Uh, you've seen it so often in church. They start with a PowerPoint and then they go on to other things, bring other things into the worship service. Shangma. Uh, I think I can ask you a quick question. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Time is up already. Okay. Whose turn to close in prayer? Simon. Amen. <coughs>